Hello and welcome to this I'll Vote 21 online meeting for the Isle of Wight County Council seat of Cowes South. A brief word for the benefit of the public, I'll Vote 21 has been formed with the sole purpose of enhancing democracy by providing an unbiased platform for candidates. We have no affiliations or funding and no candidates are aware of what questions will be asked today, although a list of topics was distributed in advance to enable candidates to prepare. All 138 candidates in this year's election have been invited either directly or via group and party leaders. The following candidates have been invited to this meeting. John Nicholson, the Conservative Party. Nathan Stubbings, the Green Party. Steph Burgess from the Liberal Democrats and Philip Atfield from the Labour Party. So in attendance, obviously we have Phil Atfield from the Labour Party and Steph Burgess from Lib Dems. Thank you and welcome to both of you. So candidates are going to be asked questions from our pool of questions, plus others that have been submitted by the public regarding island-wide issues and others regarding their specific locality. Candidates have both been informed that there is a two-minute limitation on answers. I'll raise my hand as we approach that cutoff and I request that the candidate finishes up promptly afterwards. And before commencing the questions, we're going to have two minutes each from the candidates to give a personal statement. And simply because Phil is at the top of my screen, I'm going to ask you to go first, Phil. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much for that. Um, yeah, uh, I'm Phil Atfield. I'm the uh, Labour candidate for Cows South in Northwood. I, I live in Cows with my wife, two teenage daughters, assorted cats and a dog, and the most recent addition to our household is my wife's father. So we're a multi-generational household and we have uh, the perspectives of life on the island across all age groups. Um, for most of my career, I've worked in film and TV, culminating as a visual effects supervisor and I was a proprietor of a 50 employee studio. Uh, I've been honoured to receive Emmy and BAFTA nominations for some of my work along my career journey and uh, I eventually sold my business to investors in 2008. So today I work for an education training and support company called Next Gen Skills Academy of which I'm a co-founder and I develop qualifications, apprenticeship standards, short training courses. Uh, we do that with the Department for Education, the Institute of Apprenticeships, awarding bodies and employers from the games, animation and visual effects industries. So what's the relevance of all that? Well, thanks to my background in the creative industries, I know that we can always make tomorrow better than today. Looking for improvement is something that, we, that is ingrained in me. I'm a problem solver. I don't pretend to have all the answers, but I work hard to find them. I never accept that the status quo has to be accepted just because change requires effort and innovation. I strongly believe that giving our young people the best start in life and developing talent offers the best return on investment anyone could ask for. I joined the Labour Party because I wanted to take an active role in a party dedicated to improving life for the many and not the few. The Island Labour Manifesto gives voters the chance to bring about change for good. I want to give you an idea of how that would look in practice. No one will ever disagree that eradicating child poverty is, you know, is a good, it's a good thing to do. But only the Labour Party will make eradicating child poverty a target for all council policy and how it is implemented. For example, that would mean new housing developments would have to be include affordable homes, not just expensive houses for the more fortunate. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm sure we'll hear more about those as, as the session progresses. Thanks, Phil. Steph, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Steph Burgess. I currently live in Northwood with my partner and our three children and our pet dog. Before we lived in Northwood, we were living in Cow South in the uh, estate uh, around CV Road. I've lived on the island for most of my life. I was brought up here. I went off to university, trained as a teacher. I lived in Surrey and then I came back. I've been back on the island for the past 14 years, uh, teaching for that entire time. Uh, my mum lives in Fishbourne and we offer her a lot of support um, all the way through everything through COVID and before, and she gives us a lot of support back. We love living where we do. We love the proximity to the countryside that Northwood gives us and the community spirit within the village and the proximity to the Cowes Town Centre and the um, attractions and facilities it affords. We were really impressed when we lived in the estate around CV Road, the community spirit there and how um, friendly and uh, family friendly it is as a place to live. I've never seen so many houses decorated for Halloween or for Christmas and I've never had so many trick or treaters in my life really want to start giving back to our community and to get involved with local projects 
and to find out what the needs of the people in our community are. One of the reasons I stand as a Lib Dem is that we don't have a party line. That means we can uh, start from the bottom up and work with the community and find out what they need and what they want to happen. And I feel quite passionately that that is uh, a really important part of uh, what the Liberal Democrats bring. We do have a party manifesto that uh, we believe very strongly in and we feel that does give really good off offer options for the island and to improve our communities. Um, but by no means do we have to stick to that if the local community that we serve doesn't want it. Being a teacher, obviously education and opportunities for young people is a priority for me. And I feel quite strongly that there should be more expertise on the council beyond businessmen. The council is made up quite heavily of people from business backgrounds, and that's great for um, lots of different areas of our lives on the island. Uh, but education is sorely underrepresented. Thanks very much, Steph. OK, so now we've had a chance for you both to make your personal statements to introduce yourselves. The questions are going to run, obviously, um, we're going to run through the questions and I'm going to go first of all to Phil on the first question and on the second question to Steph and to Nate. So, first question that I'd like you to consider is, do you have specific projects in mind that you would pursue in the council? You have specific projects in mind that you would pursue in the council to Phil? Yeah. Um... Something I would like to see the council uh, lead on would be uh, the, a local skills investment plan, the kind of thing that's outlined in the post-16 uh, Skills for Jobs white paper that came out this year. Um, reason for that is, apart from the fact it's, one, it's, it's my big strength at the moment and, and the area that I work in, um, uh, getting uh, technical and vocational education joined up on the island with employers so it's not just uh colleges or the you know the, the isle of white college and six forms delivering those vocational qualifications that they feel they can deliver but the ones that are actually going to lead to jobs or lead to um a progression route for a high quality apprenticeship i think that's that's the key thing and i've seen the council start trying to do that with the um they had a, a digital action planner about two years ago, I think now, which the first meeting I went to had probably 30 plus employers there. By the third meeting, there was one and it ran out of steam very quickly, I think, because there was a lack of leadership and no one was giving it um, direction. So I would like to um, the council to, to lead on developing the policy for skills training on the island, working with employers to generate jobs and uh, retrain our workforce wherever necessary thank you steph i'll repeat the question for you do you have specific projects in mind that you would pursue in the council i think if i got into council i'd be making a phone call to phil very quickly because that is part of uh, my big projects as well but i want to take it further than that i actually think that we need to get more community involvement in supporting families and young children right from a very early age to engage the children in the communities in which they live we need children to be at the centre of everything we do to improve this island for their future. So uh, I would like to start with primary school age children and getting them involved in community projects for the environment, for the garden, for um, taking care of the people around them. There needs to be much more engagement in, uh, in the, what the children are doing beyond the classroom. In the classroom that I teach, I see children with great ideas and great passion for things uh, beyond the usual curriculum subjects. And outside of school, uh, families don't always have the opportunity to um, give their children time to explore those passions and those uh, interests that the children have, especially if the families are from um, uh, lower income families. Through community partnership with businesses, with uh, community projects such as Aspiring Lives, such as the Men's Sheds projects, such as the Wombling uh, groups, the Give group on Facebook, we can um, support the children outside of school and get them involved in projects to engage with the future of this island, leading up to when they get into secondary school, once they get to GCC age group, uh, business involvement, such as Phil has suggested, where we can be teaching them and training them with skills, not just academically for future uh, generations to go to university, but also to give them greater skills of a vocational sort, which will engage them in, in the community and in what else they could be doing with their lives that will engage them and stop them being nuisance to society. Thank you very much. Okay, 
starts the um the starts the questions and now we're going to swap round. I'm going to ask Steph first of all. This question says we cannot escape the fact that services cost money and budgets are severely constrained. Can you describe ways to close the gaps between income and expenditure? So I'll just repeat that we cannot escape the fact that services cost money and budgets are severely constrained. Can you describe ways to close the gaps between income and expenditure? My background is not in economics, so I'm going to be really quite uh, candid with you and say that those are figures that I would definitely be looking at together with colleagues. However, as a member of the public looking at what the council does with our money, I am concerned at where there is so much wastage. We only have to talk about the floating bridge for two seconds before people are jumping on board with comments about why on earth does it cost so much money and why is it still not working? Uh, there's been recent news stories about the um, uh, salaries of certain members of the council and how much they're earning and whether or not they are good value for money. And I think whatever the new administration is on May 7th, that should be a high priority for them to look at where the council money is being spent and to make sure that it's being spent very wisely. We've just been hit with a 5% council tax rise um, and we need to make sure that that money is going to the right areas to support the right people and not being wasted on white elephants such as the floating bridge debacle. Um, I'd like to see more transparency in where the money is spent and I'd like to see more uh, ownership and responsibility taken for things like the floating bridge when uh, that happens. We need to make sure that is working for the people who these cows and cows. Thank you very much, Steph. Bill, would you like me to repeat the question for you? Yeah, go on, please. Okay. We cannot escape the fact that services cost money and budgets are severely constrained. Can you describe ways to close the gaps between income and expenditure? Thank you. Well, the first place I would start would be looking at where you're currently spending it. And uh, I think as Steph was already alluding to that, you know, that there is always wastage uh, in the, um, the numbers that we've run and I don't have them to hand. Um, uh, we've, uh, we think we've already identified some savings that can be made, but more importantly, um, the ruling body on the council has taken control of the scrutiny committee. So the scrutiny committee is currently um, only scrutinizing what suits the ruling body. And that's a big problem. That's a very big problem. So the first place I would look is you know, where is the current money being spent? After that, um, we'd like to change the way that the council operates fundamentally in developing a, a community wealth building policy. We've seen this in action in places like Preston, which is a, a council that's a similar size to the Isle of Wight, similar amounts of turnover. Some of the monies are in slightly different pots, but what's happened in Preston is the, the council has adopted a, a policy of buying locally and improving, um, investing locally to improve what, what's on offer, to improve local services. So that ends up, in the case of Preston, it's put uh, around 70 million pounds a year back into the local economy in Preston, working with anchor institutions like hospitals uh, and the council itself. Uh, and that is an economic driver, having that money that is not leaving the council. So in the case of the Isle of Wight, we're estimating between 30 and 40 million pounds could remain on the island just out of current expenditure, creating jobs on the island, improving um, job security on the island. And combined with that, um, we'd be looking to change policy about where the council invests its money. Why did the council invest 35 million pounds in uh, uh, warehousing in Manchester, for instance? There is money that can be invested on the island. Okay, thank you very much for that, Phil. Um, right, so I'm going to come to you first for the next question then. Um, and this says, looking at the island, which has pockets of significant deprivation, what steps could be made here to enhance and develop opportunities in those areas? So looking at the island, which has pockets of significant deprivation, what steps could be made here to enhance and develop opportunities in those areas? Absolutely. Well, the, my first point of call around that at the moment is the... Um, is the place plan, which is, I think, still relatively fresh, that's, uh, um, that's been published for um, cows and Northwood parishes. Um, in that, uh, there's most of that report reads as um, a listing of things that you, you might already know or you're not particularly surprised by, but there are uh, recommendations in, in there for 
uh, regenerating uh, the natural cap capital and the social capital capital of the area, um, and the um, economic capital, so jobs, basically. So that in order to address deprivation, um, you, I believe that you, you have to approach that with a, a, a mixed policy of getting making it affordable for employers to start up and to expand and to feed them the necessary skills, people with the necessary skills. So it comes back to the uh, idea of working on a local skills investment plan. That's the way at which you can, where you can identify what jobs are needed, what skills are needed for those jobs. How do you get people from the job they're currently in to be cross-trained into a new role, which is well-paid, sustainable, and from that, um, you know, a, a decent life flows with food, housing, warmth, the lot. So that's that's where I would go with, with that one in terms of um, addressing uh, how do we create opportunities. I'd work with employers to see what skills are, are needed and refer to the, the brand new place plan. Okay, thanks very much, Phil. Steph, would you like me to repeat the question for you? No, I think I'm okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah, I, I would come back to um, this community involvement um, that we would like to see happening. Um, where there is deprivation, there's also a, quite often lack of aspiration amongst young people, and we need to change that. We need to change children's, young people's mindsets from being that of uh, helplessness. We need them to be engaged and we need them to be motivated, and that will all come through this community engagement project. We also need to do something about the town centres. And we need to make sure that they are not dying a death as they currently are under the Conservative regime. Uh, there's been a new story this week of uh, the plans for St George's Park and there's going to be another out of town shopping area there, which is totally against what I think is what should be going on. We need to get the shops in our town centres back up and running and busy so that the local shopkeepers, the people who've got local businesses in the towns, um, have got the support of other shops around them that's bringing people into town. Because currently people don't go into town because there is nothing, there's perceived to be nothing there for them. Parking charges are far too high. And I totally support the Labour um, uh, idea of, of reducing parking charges um, in town centres to try and encourage people to go back in. We also need a, a more environmentally friendly public transport plan to make it easier for people to get into towns, to use those facilities that are there and to try and encourage small businesses, start-up businesses back into our town centre. Town centres don't need to be shops. They don't need to be um, just full of high street shops. They certainly don't need to be just full of um, fast food and takeaways. There are lots of start-up businesses and temporary pop-up businesses that could be going into those shops, creating jobs, creating skills, as Phil's already said, for our young people and to use the space in a more wise manner. We have got a lot of people on the Isle of Wight with a lot of skills that are being underutilised and undervalued at the moment. And we need to engage the community more in doing more to support the people who need it. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'll come to you first on the next question then, Steph. Um, and this says that we've received several questions actually related to special educational needs and autistic children and how much parents struggle with provision for them. If elected, what will you do to champion the rights of those children? Would you like me to repeat that? No, I'm fine, okay. thank you. Uh, well, obviously, um, education is, is my thing. And as I already said in my opening statement, there's not enough um, expertise on the council at the moment with teachers. And one of the other Liberal Democrat uh, candidates, uh, Tracy Nickett, she's standing in Ride. Uh, this is also an area of passion for her, having been through quite a tricky time um, herself as a mother. Um, we need to um, improve services in this area massively. The Conservatives decided uh, in 2017 to say that we want to 25% of our schools to be rated outstanding. Um, by, uh, by now in 2021, we have no schools rated as outstanding under their leadership. We need to do something about it. We need to invest more in schools and we need to support schools. Um, we also need to raise awareness of what autism means because people label children um, with uh, special education needs with a word like autism and there's still not enough understanding out there of what that means. And unfortunately, we put the phrase special educational needs out there into the public realm and people write off the child. And that is absolutely the opposite of what should be going on. 
children with autism are not to be written off. People on the autistic spectrum with autistic spectrum disorder should not be written off by any stretch because they often have far superior skills in certain areas than, um, than you or I, for example. And I feel really quite passionately that we ought to be making sure that there is support out there for the parents, but also that the wider community understands where their skills can lie. And I'm really impressed by some of our supermarkets and how our supermarkets are clearly um, employing people with um, educational needs and dis different disabilities uh, that wouldn't necessarily be employable in other areas or in the past. And I'm really pleased that they are engaging in that practice now. So yeah, education is clearly the top of my, my priorities along with Tracy and, and autism is, is a particular niche one that I think is still under, under understood. Thank you. Phil, I'll just repeat the, the full question for you again. We received um, several questions related to special educational needs and autistic children and how much parents struggle with provision for them. So if elected, what would you do to champion the rights of those children? Yeah, this is a topic that's quite close to my heart. Uh, this morning on my morning dog walk, I ran into two other parents. Um, so the three of us standing there with um, sharing our experience of, of raising autistic children. Um, and they're all, they're, they're on a spectrum. They're all unique and brilliant in their own ways. Uh, they all face different challenges, but a common challenge that they face is just not being understood by the school system. Um, uh, so the, today I heard the example of a school governor uh, turning around to a mother and saying, your child is making bad choices when that child 18 months later has had to go through a, a legal challenge to the council to get provision uh, for special in, in a specialist unit and um, now finally has an EHCP and a diagnosis of autism. So I think the, the lack of knowledge uh, amongst senior leadership in schools is frightening. So if there's one thing that we could do as a, a council would be to lead the charge on educating people who frankly should know better um, a, a, about the, you know, all children manner and a, and a child who you might think is acting out is very often a child who is under stress and suffering uh, huge anxiety. So I think it's the... Um, Education of the educators, uh, no disrespect to anyone else here, um, but, but it, it is, is important. I think we're on the same page there, actually. So it's, um, that's what I would like to see the council leading on is a challenging senior management, senior leadership in schools and, and the governors to actually understand the challenges of autism and look at their SEN provision and ask themselves how they could improve it before we just go down the route of saying more money, more money, more money. Just being better at what you do would be a good start. Thank you very much. Okay, um, the next question is still um, around education, but this is about adult education. Adult education on the island is limited. What would you do to encourage organisations on the island to provide opportunities in this area? So I'll just repeat that for Phil. Adult education on the island is limited. What would you do to encourage organisations on the island to provide opportunities in this area? Well, I'll give you an example. Um, I'm a member of the, the GMB union. I only became a, a member this year. It was um, in part to help broaden my understanding of the challenges that people were facing in their working lives. And, but it came with a, with a, with a really um, quite inspiring, pleasant surprise in that the GMB union is running... Um, a lot of educational support and offers opportunities for people who are members to cross train and, and retrain. One of them I thought was quite uh, um, uh, innovative, which is they, um, uh, if you're a gamer, if you enjoy playing games, there's a course you can do where uh, you can take your gaming skills and see if they could be adapted to um, a process, uh, the quality assurance process that you have in games or the problem solving. It's identifying things that you do for fun and turning them into a skill. Um, the one area that I've fed back to the GMB on that I thought they could do better at or, or explore would be working directly with employers uh, to, uh, to identify where the new skills are going to be. Employers like ASDA, they've been in the press recently as um, having yeah, a threat of several thousand employees 
jobs being marked for redundancy. Well, those jobs will go, those roles will go, but they will employ other people in other roles. So let's, people like, you know, unions are well placed to work with employers to identify what the new skills are, the new coming skills that are required, and then to work with uh, stakeholders like further education, like um, local authorities, like LEPs, to build the training plans that help people migrate from one job role to another one. Thank you. Steph, I'll just repeat that again for you. Adult education on the island is limited. What would you do to encourage organisations on the island to provide opportunities in this area? Uh, I, I think I think fairly like, again, it was, it was singing from a very similar song sheet here. I think we've with with the skill sets that we've got in some of the um, businesses and companies on the island, um, we are very well placed to uh, develop skills in adults uh, in those areas. We've got some really innovative companies on the island who are doing an awful lot, um, but perhaps we need to open them up further to supporting um, youngsters in you know in their in their GCC and their sick form slot in the way of apprenticeships, but also in uh, adults who may have some transferable skills from similar um, similar workforces uh, that where they perhaps need to reskill for something. We The one thing we're hugely lacking on the island is further education. The, the fact that we don't have a university here at all makes it very difficult to engage youngsters into wanting to leave the island to go to university. So what we need to do is utilise the organisations we've already got, such as uh, the smart um, training organisations, such as the Isle of Wight College, in making sure that there is enough provision there for the skills that the islands need, for the for the skills, for the jobs that, of the future that they're going to need, so um, that they can transfer from one profession to another, or they can tweak whatever they've got in their background from, from jobs that they've had in the past. Okay, thank you very much, Steph. Right, um, so changing the, the topic now, we're going to move on from education. Uh, we have had many questions pertaining to cross-Solent travel links, ferries, reliability and costs. How would you address existing concerns and do you have a vision for improved connectivity? We've had many questions about cross-Solent travel links, ferries, reliability and costs. How would you address existing concerns and do you have a vision for improved connectivity? Steph, to you first. Oh, opening a can and letting all the worms out. Um, where, where do you start? We we need more regulation of the ferries, I think is, is absolutely the top priority because they have not quite got a monopoly, but they might as well have because we've only got the two major car ferry companies plus hover travel. There's got to be more regulation. What's happened in COVID has absolutely horrified me that there has been not been more pressure from the council or from our MP in ensuring that the ferries were putting the island's needs first. They definitely didn't do that. They definitely put profit first and they should have uh, done more to check that essential travel journeys were the only sorts of journeys being made. The fact that they are um, businesses that are trying to make a profit out of this puts us already on the back foot. And I think we need to do more to try and combat that. Um, so if I was elected as part of the council, I, that would be an absolute priority for us to try and uh, ensure the government supports us in uh, regulating the ferries more and uh, we find ways to make the ferries more favourable to, to the island communities. It happens elsewhere in the UK. Um, they don't suffer the same uh, pressure from costs of ferries that we do. And so we need to do more to try and mimic those those setups. Would I go for a fixed link is a is a very difficult question to answer politically. I was always completely against the idea of a fixed link. I think a fixed link is still um, an impossibility in terms of funding. I don't think we would ever be in a situation where we could raise that amount of money to, to put a fixed link in place. So we've got to work with, with what we've got, I'm afraid. Um, and and Currently, I don't think it is working for our faith. I don't think it's working for Islanders. 
Okay, thank you. Sorry, I didn't know if you were coughing. Sorry, yeah. You're hearing continuing. Um, right, so Phil, just, just to repeat that, so the many questions um, that we've had pertaining to cross-silent travel links, ferries, reliability and costs, how would you address existing concerns and do you have a vision for improved connectivity? Yep, uh, as I've said, that is, that is such a, a can of worms. Um, we'll address the, the fixed link first of all. Um, that's not a quick solution from if it was to, if you were to start a project tomorrow, I'd be surprised if you would have a fixed link already in 15 years time. Um, and you would have to predict what this, what type of crossing it would need to be. Would it be um, a rail? Would it be road? Uh, would it be some kind of roll on, roll off? You have to look ahead to that and it would never be free. It would never be free. You'd pay for it somewhere along the line. So I, I don't think it's um, a particularly viable idea and not one that looking at the timescales, I'm gonna put a great deal of effort into. What I will put effort into is um, bringing back some of the legislation which was um, suspended during COVID around um, uh, the monopolies and how the uh, ferry operators operate because they all the restrictions on them um, collaborating were removed and this may, well, some, some, some people may remember this, but it was surprising when I first came across it. Um, RMP actually suggested taking the ferry companies into public ownership. And that's something that I would uh, support having done, uh, you know, subject to due diligence. So having a stake in the ferry companies would give islanders a voice uh, in how they run and make um, any service level agreement that is you know, put in place with the uh, transport providers something that's enforceable. And I think it's, it's, it's vital that islanders have more control over their, um, their uh, transport links, simply because we've got, we've got very little choice. We can't walk off the island, we, we're stuck here. So um, that's what I would do, I would uh, enforce service level agreements and take a stake. Thank you. Right, Phil, next question for you first. What would you do to address all the empty shops in each town? The main streets are dying. What should the council do to specifically address this issue? Well, it's interesting. Here in Cowes, my impression is that the high street is doing relatively well. That's not to say that every shop is full or are, or the high street is as busy as it as it could be, but it has survived relatively well. And let and I hope the next few weeks reveal that you know, the shops are open and they're starting to thrive again. Uh, elsewhere on the island, we've we've got wider problems where you know we, we've lost big chains over the years. Um, we all hear a lot of a lot of conversation around shopping has changed forever, retail has changed, the high street is never coming back. I don't subscribe to that wholly uh, retail is changing and has changed but um i think people after covid are going to want to be able to get out and have an experience again they want to get they want they want to be in a high street they want to witness social activity around them they'll want to talk to someone about buying their pair of shoes or whatever it is um so i think that's a, uh, the high street still has some life in it we can help it at the in the very short term by offering free parking for an hour, um, free parking after six uh, overnight to get people back in, into our town centres. Um, and then we have to look at a, a sustained plan, a plan of um, what are the properties that, okay, we turn them into residential. So we change the mix of our high streets over t time. But it's not one, um, overnight solution and I don't think it's the um, the plan that the council have to blitz the eastern part of Newport and erect what there I've no idea they don't even have an idea and they don't even know where the money's coming from they just say we're going to redevelop all of that next week so I, I think it's um, to, to regenerate the high streets we have to engage with our communities and, and engage with uh, the residents about what would you like to have in a high street what would make it be a, a good place to be, a welcoming place to be? Uh, and I think that could be a draw for 
tourists as well because we i don't think the the mass market uh, of uh, zipping all over the world is going to come back in a very quickly that's going to take some years to, to happen again so i think um having places which are destinations somewhere you can go uh do it for discretionary purposes you know purchase you know, purchases sorry not purposes purchases um to have a meal have a coffee be outside um meet people i think that's the way to go with the high streets thank you okay steph um so just to reiterate then so the comment is that the main streets are dying um and what would the council do to specific what should the council do sorry to specifically address this issue well the first thing they shouldn't do is allow more big out of town shopping areas uh, the high streets died in the first place because of that if you've got a brownfield site and you are putting more out of town shopping areas on it there is something very very wrong and very very backwards in that our out of town brownfield areas should be used for housing the council is already missing its housing uh, targets so why they are thinking of putting more shops in those sorts of areas i don't know we're going back to the town centers um i think we need to pedestrianize this a bit more uh, and look at the european models of why their town centers are still surviving European town centres are more pedestrianised, they've got more, um, as Phil has said, more things to bring people together. So I'm not suggesting more fast food restaurants by any stretch of the imagination, but I am suggesting that those uh, cafes and restaurants that are in town centres should be given outdoor space uh, for tables and for socialising for people to get together. Um, somebody on Facebook um, jokingly suggested that he would like to turn the entire town centre of uh, Newport into a skate park. And it was very much a joke, but I don't see why there shouldn't be some forms of entertainment, some forms of uh, parks for children within the town centre. The parks don't have to be leafy and green. There can be places for children to be entertained while their parents enjoy a coffee under their watchful eye. So I think pedestrianising some of it is a good start. I think the, the, the redu reduction of parking charges that the Labour system is a very good start as well. I would go further and I would make that a council tax linked thing so that that benefit was for island, genuine islanders who pay their council tax. Uh, I wouldn't actually um, offer that to the people who have got a second home here, uh, I'm afraid. Um, better transport links to get people in, as I said before. Um, but the startup businesses, the galleries, the um, skills based type activities that people could be doing in town centres is also another way of getting people in. You know, we've got some fantastic um, jewellery making um, businesses. We've got fire art type businesses where they could be in the town centres to bring people together for social and for, for entertainment purposes, not just for shopping. But we do need to get some big high street shops back in to draw people back in. Thank you. OK, this is um, more specific to your area than um, now. So, Steph, first of all, knowing your local community, as you do, what local issue would you like to address that you know is of concern to residents? Knowing your local community as you do, what local issue would you like to address that you know is of concern to residents? Okay, so we start with the basics, um, dog fouling and littering. Um, and for some reason, we still can't get that right. If we can't get the basics uh, right, then we're not doing something wrong. The, the dog litter, the dog Fowling bins are clearly not being empty frequently enough. I don't think they're well enough signposted, and I don't just mean on the post they're on. There needs to be a sign at the end of the street or end of the lane that they're on to let people then know that there is a dog poo bin coming up. There's a huge issue in enforcement of penalty fines. We don't have enough uh, way to enforce uh, and, and to penalise people who are littering and, and, and leaving their dog it's not just leaving the dog fouling there, it's the bagging up the dog fouling and leaving it there that really winds people up even more. So we do need to look at the way that those fines are enforced. Um, a huge other issues uh, for residents in our area is, is the concern about housing and building on greenfield land. The 66 houses that are going to be built behind Oxford Street, I thought had been rejected, but it has actually been put on hold with a permission to go ahead and I think that is totally totally wrong and the people do not want it. Why our council is not looking, uh, listening to what residents want I do not know. We cannot fit that much more housing into our area because we are so restricted on access. There are only two roads into cows especially when the chain ferry is out of action. One of those is the main Newport road 
which currently has got roadworks on it again that I noticed this morning. And then Pallance Road, which is already um, a problem being used as a rat run for people to escape. And the people of Pallance Road are quite sick of it, quite frankly. So we can't get more housing into cows as it stands at the moment, especially if the floating bridge is not working. And the third uh, big issue that I've had people contact me about is about the um, movement from children from primary school to secondary school, where they're not getting their first choice. There was a big problem last year where a lot of children from Northwood Primary didn't get into Cows Enterprise College and were being sent to Newport for secondary. But there were children who were in Newport getting into Cows Enterprise College when they didn't want to be there. So we do need to look at the school's admission and transfer between primary and secondary uh, because families need what's best for them. Thank you very much. So Phil, again, knowing the local community as you do, what local issue would you like to address that you know is a concern to residents? You're on mute, Phil. It had to happen, didn't it? <laughs> it had, one of us had to be on mute. Uh, yeah, as a dog walker, dog fouling gets on my uh, nerves as well. Uh, when you see people not clearing up or they haven't cleared up, you rarely see someone in the act which is part of the problem with enforcement. Um, I do think we uh, could probably have more bins and better signposting, uh, as Steph suggested. Um, we could spend a lot of money trying to enforce fines and that, that would probably never pay for itself, but we could spend some money on promoting um, good behavior. Maybe it, we trial uh, providing poo bags on, on the worst sites. It's, it's worth trying something like that to see if it makes any difference. Um, it is a problem. It is a, it's, a, it's disgusting and it's a health hazard. So always worth ha having a good cracker. And after that, whether it's, uh, we need to look at um, stricter dog licensing and who has dogs. But I think that is something that's probably gonna have to come in a, a, a national level. Um, other prime issue for me, and I, and, um, I experienced this on Pallance Road the other evening when I was out leafleting with my two girls and dog speeding, um, that it's crazy when someone is coming down Pallance Road and they're doing 50, at my guess, uh, which is, is to, we need to have um, more signs, more of the reactive signs that come on when you are speeding. Um, and spot checks. It, it, it would be very easy to uh, put a speed camera on Pallance Road five o'clock of an evening for a week, and you'd soon get the word we get out that you know, speeding down Pallance Road is not a good idea because typically you get people rushing from home from work. It's used as a rat run because um, travel in and out of this town isn't always that easy. Island Roads last summer even managed to conspire to um, uh, seal us off. You, you remember, Steph, don't you? Yeah, we were sealed off just through a lack of joined up thinking. So uh, speeding would be an issue for me. Um, uh, and the, the the primary to secondary transfer thing, that was something that... Um, uh, it's a shame John Nicholson's not here because I'd like to ch challenge him on it. He was the guy who in the, uh, the Northwood Parish Council minutes basically said, we've got to accept that kids from North Northwood won't get into cows because that's the way the world is. And that to me just sums up everything that I find unacceptable um, in politics. We do not have to accept something that is mediocre or poor we we are agents of change if we want to be and we can fight for what is the right thing and clearly uh, ch children who are educated in the clouds cluster um, stop real quickly if you could please yeah well local kids should have access to local schooling thank so. you thank you Sorry to have brought that there, but that was uh, quite a lot over time. It's just a reminder about the, the two minutes um, that we're trying to keep. Through. Sorry, I didn't. You shrunk down into a small window. I missed your hand. Oh, sorry. Um, okay. So the next um, questions there, we've got quite a lot of local questions. Uh, we're obviously not going to be able to get through all of them, um, but I'm going to first of all put this one. Uh, you've touched on um, further development. So this is for you first, um, Phil. 
Uh, will you ensure that no further development is passed until health infrastructure is increased in cows? Well, our um, manifesto pledges that um, no more um, greenfield sites, brownfield over greenfield. Any planning uh, should take into account um, uh, local amenities. Um, it's interesting that, that the question is around healthcare. I suspect that's probably someone who's experienced trying to access Cow's Medical Centre, um, which I think has become difficult from what I from what I'm experiencing uh, with my own family, um, and certainly from what um, an incumbent councillor in uh, uh, Cow's Medina, Laura P.C. Wilcox, was telling me recently, was that she was in uh, Cow's Medical Centre seeing one of the doctors, and she asked the doctor, is there anything I could do to help you? And his response was, tell people you're open. So somewhere in the mix here, there are doctors thinking that, oh, people don't think we're open, they're not coming through the door. And people are finding it hard to uh, get access. So it's not clear to me at the moment whether we ha we don't have enough provision in cows uh, or whether it's an access issue. So I'd like to look at the access issue first of all, and then um, just, you know, work out whether we should be looking to increase provision. It's clearly a priority. Tying that with housing together, I think, is a bit of a, a bit of a red herring, but you, you, you have to look at all these things in the round, always, and you have to join up the dots. So uh, yes, I'm behind the principle of good planning leads to good results, and that's what we should be doing. Thank you. So Steph, I'll just repeat that again. Um, will you ensure that no further development is passed until health infrastructure is increased in cows? Yeah, I, I think Phil's right. I think it is slightly um, narrow question. Um, you know, the, the housing development depends on a lot more things than just the health. Um, I'm certainly against uh, huge developments in cows because of the transport issues that I've already mentioned, and I'm certainly against building on Greenfield. I think the health um, centre issues are, I mean, getting hold of your GP has become notoriously bad no matter where you are. I think quite often that's due to phone lines. Um, you know, you phone up a doctor's at eight o'clock in the morning and it's engaged straight away because everybody's trying to phone up at eight o'clock in the morning. By the time you get through, the appointments are gone. I'm very against bashing the health service. My parents both worked for the NHS before they retired. Um, and I think the NHS do an amazing job. And uh, this year in particular, they've had a really tough time. But I think this is more historic than just COVID. I think the fact there is only one health centre to serve such a large area as Cowles, Gurnars and Northwood is, is, is a bit of a problem. Um, especially when you think about the, the, the help, the phone lines getting in to make an appointment in the first place. And I think perhaps that might be where some of the problems are coming from. But I definitely think it's something that we need to discuss directly with them rather than, you know, um, theorising about it between ourselves in a political discussion. I think it's something that they want support with by the sounds of it. And, um, you know, as I said, I'm not going to bash the, I'm not going to bash the NHS by any stretch of the imagination, but whatever it is that's causing this perception that you can't get an appointment in cows, we certainly need to find a way around it. And if that means we need another health service in this area, then, then I would certainly be supportive of that. As I said, I am surprised there is only one in cows. Why there isn't um, at least a, a satellite one in Northwood or Gurnard, um, you know, that, that, that might be a possibility or an idea that we should be exploring. But it is definitely something that we need to discuss directly with them rather than coming up with, you know, ideas from the sky just between us. Okay, thank you very much. Um, right, so this is this is a, a, a kind of more um, well, it's a broader question, not specifically about services. Um, Steph, I'm going to ask you first. Do you think cows would be a good place to trial a more direct participatory form of democracy? Do you think that cows would be a good place to trial a more direct participatory form of democracy? More participants, say that again. <laughs> Do you think cows would be a good place to trial a more direct participatory form of democracy? I'm not exactly what short, sort of form that would take, but um, I'm all for uh, a more direct involvement with the community in democracy. I definitely believe in talking to people, um, you know, as I've just said about the health centre. The fact that I've lived in cows, um, 
and northward for, for such a long time and never once met our um, our, our councillor, I think tells you quite a lot about how I feel about local government's involvement with the community. We should be open and we should be talking to people directly. I'm now on the parish council, so my intention is to get to know as many people as quickly as possible in our area um, to find out what they need. So I, I, I definitely think that you know we, we need more engagement in politics. There's a ward in Ride where there's 15% voting rate. That's not enough. People mm. need to be more engaged in the democratic process and they need to understand how the democratic process works because we don't. And I certainly didn't before I stood you know, in front of the Lib Dems going, I'm going to have a go at this because I believe very passionately that the Isle of Wight needs a better service. And yeah, if Cowles is a good place for starting, why not? If it's a place that I'm working, I'm very up to starting up a, a better engagement with the community in how democracy works and, and how our political system works, for sure. Thank you. Bill, do you think that cows would be a good place to trial a more direct participatory form of democracy? Well, the, there was something I was thinking about earlier was uh, someone posed me the question of um, how, how would you get Islanders more involved uh, in the council? And I think it's a similar territory to that. And um, uh, I think one of the things that we, uh, uh, this is especially happens uh, with the, um, the parish councils and the town councils is where they could be key, is people look at council meetings as being deadly dull, very dry places uh, with, with um, old people who are, you know, you're not quite sure if they've got a pulse. Sorry, Steph, if either of us get there, that's, that's how they look at us. So, um, and I think we need to change that. And one way we can change that is by um, ha having council meetings, which aren't just, here's the fixed agenda, we're going to run through these points, but they can be more um, open forum and open mic, if you like, in that people can come along and they get their two minutes to pose a question. And it can also be tied in with uh, events more like a show and tell once a year let's celebrate what's happening in the town and if the if the local councils are leading of that and the and the, the county if the, you know, the Isle of Wight council is participating in what's happening in uh, parish and town councils in an area so you'd probably do it for a cluster that would be a good way of doing outreach to everyone saying look that these are the things that have been in questions that have been raised by uh, you the voters in this area, these are the different ways it's been addressed. Get people involved that way is what I would do. But may, be bring the, the the debating and the decision making out to people and show them the results. Thank you. Sorry, to, that was a bit of a, a red herring perhaps that was through you there at the beginning. Um, so this question, first of all, is for Bill, and we've, we've touched on it slightly before. But um, if elected, would you support the scrapping of the floating bridge? And then there's, there's kind of three parts to this. Would you support looking into the viability of a lift bridge to link East Cows with Cows? Would you support spending money on a viability study for a fixed link to the island? So I'll repeat those three parts. Would you support scrapping of the floating bridge, looking into the viability of a lift bridge to link East Cows with Cows and spending money on a viability study for a fixed link to the island? So uh, let's see if there's scrapping, right. I'll start with the last one first. Uh, no, I'm not going to commit any taxpayers money to a viability study of a fixed link. Just, I think that's just a waste of time, frankly. Unless if someone can get funding from uh, a source which isn't coming out of um, council tax revenues, maybe, but otherwise council tax revenues, they've got enough on them without looking at uh, this because we're, we're hard strapped at the moment. Um, Feasibility study for a lifting bridge. Well, why just a lifting bridge? Why not a, a, a fixed bridge at a different point from, say, Stag Lane over? You could look at that if you are going to scrap. If you're going to scrap the um, the floating bridge, you'd have to look at those alternatives. Absolutely. Uh, I'd actually look at the, the business case of scrapping what we've got and starting over, ideally with a, a new vessel built locally. There's, there's, a, there's still a lot of questions to be answered by current administration and the previous administration about how we've ended up where we have but um but i th i would definitely be in favor of building a business plan that says we get rid of this thing 
build a new one. We'll have it by this point and it will pay for itself in this number of years. That's what I would do. Thank you, Phil. So Steph, just repeat that question in full for you. If elected, would you support the scrapping of the floating bridge? Would you support looking into the viability of a lift bridge to link East Cows with cows? And would you support spending money on a viability study for a fixed link to the island? Again, I'm with Phil on the, on the last one, the viability study of a fixed link. If somebody else is going to pay for it, absolutely. But the viability study is going to cost the taxpayer on the Isle of Wight an awful lot of money for something that he has already alluded to is going to take at least, at least 15 years to achieve. I would love a fixed link. If somebody could wave a magic wand and give us the money and it would happen and it wouldn't impact negatively on the environment and it could be operated in such a way that we don't get swamped with loads and loads of traffic, yeah, but it's not going to happen, unfortunately. And I'm not, as, I, as Phil was saying, I'm not going to waste money on a viability study there. Um, the scrapping of the floating bridge is uh, one that I, I think we need to look at when we get in, into council. I think I, need to, I would like to know a little bit more detail about where it's gone wrong, why it's gone wrong, and whose responsibility it is. Clearly, if that particular vessel is not fit for purpose, then it needs to go if it cannot be um, adapted to, to do the job it was brought to do. But I'd very much like to know whose responsibility it is and, and where that went wrong. Um, in terms of a lift bridge in Cows to East Cows, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not an engineer by any stretch of the imagination, but I'm not entirely sure whether that site would be appropriate. But as Phil said, there are other places on the river where things could happen. The stag lane option has been talked about before, and I think that that might well be a, be a, a possibility. The, the way traffic flows is quite important. As I've already said, the traffic in and out of cows, the main road, that Newport to Cows Road is incredibly busy already. So if you're going to move the um, chain ferry site, if you're going to move the floating bridge site to stag lane and not have anything between us and these cows, number one, that's not great for these cows, but number two, that's going to direct more traffic out on that Newport Road. So I think we do still need something at the chain ferry site, whether it is a replacement chain ferry to the one we've got there or an alternative. I don't know. As I said, I'm not an engineer, but I would certainly be supportive of looking at different options for that fixed bridge on a fixed link to the Isle of Wight, I'm afraid. No. Thank you. OK, I think uh, we've got time probably before we hear from you for your closing statements. I think we've got time for one last question. So this is going to be for Steph first. Um, and this question is uh, regarding cows and Gurnard. Will there be any safeguard to keep a proper boundary between these areas? Or will it be just left to planning to give property developers the right to do what they want and just join it all up? Do you want me to repeat that, Steph? Okay, so sorry, and also you're on mute. So will there be any safeguard to keep a proper boundary between these areas? Or will it be just left to planning to give property developers the right to do what they want and just join it all up? Yeah, I'm, whoever wrote that, I, I, I feel their pain quite strongly. I had a geography lesson this week where we talked about the merging of villages and towns together because people are building on greenfield. As I've already stated, I'm very against building on greenfield uh, land. So as far as I'm concerned, there should be no further developments. The development that's taken place on Place Road between Place Road and Gurnard, though not only uh, is that... Uh, Totally, was that totally inappropriate? But those houses are far too big to be useful to the island community. Any building development that happens needs to be um, for island families to be affordable to them and appropriate to their needs. And they're not. Those are massive houses that are definitely catering for uh, a mainland market. So yeah, it's keeping the boundaries between the villages and between the towns is quite is, is important. But it's the prevention of greenfield building that for me is, is the priority in that question and I will not be endorsing Greenfield site building. Thank you. Phil, would you like me to repeat the question for you? Yep. Sorry, back with you now. No, that's, that's fine. Uh, um, uh, Greenfield building is the last resort. You have to have a very good reason for it. There are plenty of brownfield sites. Um, we should be prioritising uh, affordable housing, council housing even. Um, I, note, I note, I remember from 2017 in the general election hustings, our current MP, when asked what he would do to, um, for the island to promote, um, to do something about the, the housing crisis, he said build council houses, which is a, was an interesting one from a, a Tory MP who's made no effort to persuade the council to ever do that. Which is that, so um, some people will say, and I think to an audience if they think it will go down well. Um, but no, no building 
keep the keep the area separate. Um, but we have to bear in mind that we do need to perhaps build facilities for healthcare, as we've discussed elsewhere. Um, the the, um, the the place plan has got some interesting ideas about joining up open spaces in the area uh, to create more community uh, engagement and um, and build in, you know, community investment in the area. So I think that's where our, our focus should be going about helping people get round our separate places where we live uh, without the car um, so they can we can all enjoy the outside world that, you know, that we're blessed with here but yeah but the, the simple answer we'll, we'll keep the green spaces thank you very much thank you so thank you very much that's the end of the questions for this session thank you Steph thanks Phil um, before we finish the, the recording I just want to um, give you the opportunity to um, reflect on the the experience and to, and to provide a closing statement again no more than a couple of minutes so Steph if you'd like to go first yes thank you very much I um, have really enjoyed this process uh, not just this hustings but I've really enjoyed getting out in the community and meeting people I've really enjoyed doing my leaflet drops and chatting to our local community I think it is time that North Reading House South had a change I think it's time they had somebody in position for them that wanted to engage with them and who wants to find out what they need and what they want. I think the current council needs a change. I think it needs a bit of a shake up. The um, Liberal Democrats are committed to changing the way the council is run. The fact that we have a, um, a system in place where there is a cabinet to make most of the decisions without a committee in place is a scary one. And I agree with what Phil said earlier about the scrutiny committee, how that is made up of people from the same party that they're scrutinising is beyond me. We need a decent opposition in our council. So I think it's time that Cows and uh, Northwood, Cows South and Northwood uh, started the change for the council in that. I live in Northwood, I lived in Cows South for a few years and I have children in our uh, system and I care passionately about what is best for families on the island and what is best for education on the island. And uh, I'm part of the parish council now, so I intend to start at grassroots and work my way up. And if I'm honoured with people's votes to get into the council, I'm going to do my best for this area. Thank you very much, Steph. Bill? Well, uh, I've really enjoyed this afternoon. I, I really didn't know what to expect. It's the first uh, hustings like this uh, I I've done. And, it and, it's and it's good to be posed a variety of questions that, that put your gut reactions and your thoughts to test you out. It's a good thing. So uh, thank you for staging this. Um, this election, every four years or so, we all as voters get an opportunity to make some change. Um, uh, Islanders can take some control back because we've currently handed it over to a, a, a ruling group who aren't that good at it. They're not that competent. Um, and they don't have the best interests of everyone at heart. And they do, that. what they have running through them is an attitude of, it's always been this way. It always has to be this way. And, or, and we can either vote for more austerity and hopelessness, or we can vote for change. And people who uh, genuinely believe that, that change is something that can happen and that we, that councillors work for the good of everyone to improve our, our, our our lives here on this island. Something I didn't labour much before was mentioned briefly was the community wealth building idea. That, that really is at the core of everything we're, we're, we're doing. We, we um, Labour is often challenged with where are you getting the money from? Well, that's fair enough. The money is there and we're looking to redistribute it so it gets invested in the local economy. That's the main, main idea that we want to get across and we're over time we'll see big changes um my background is one of the, i don't let problems lie i have enjoyed starting to hear from people about uh, the issues in the area i very much enjoyed hearing the questions today and they're, they're chiming with the, the things that i've already heard it's good to hear that people care about things like SEND, SEND provision and as a councillor uh, i'd be proud to represent um, Cow South and Norwood and fight for those issues that people are concerned about because 
they're the same ones as my family have as well and everyone else I know. Thank, Thank you. you, Jay. Thanks, Phil. Thank you to both of you um, for joining us this, this, this afternoon. Um, it's great that you've taken the opportunity to, to share your thoughts and your um, priorities with people who potentially will be selecting you as their local councillors. So, um, yeah, Phil Atfield from Labour, Steph Burgess from Lib Dems. Um, just want to say before we leave, uh, to those of you who are watching, thank you for, for watching and hope it's been helpful and don't forget to vote.